can often glean great theology from cartoons. One of my greatest and favorite theologians is Daffy Duck. When I was growing up, I thought he was a priest because, you know, he, he dresses in black and he has that white strip that goes around his neck. I mean, he just looked just like one. And as I grew up, I found out that he's indeed a whole, I know a whole lot of clergy who are a lot like Daffy Duck. You know, greedy, self-centered, impetuous, compulsive. We all know the kind of pastor that goes that way. And nevertheless, <coughs> none here would be that way. Right, Brian? <coughs> yeah, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, but most important theologian I can think of for today's message dealing with the transfiguration of the Lord is that great theologian which also became a great uh, series of movies. I guess it might be great, I don't know. So you may or may not like that kind of movie, but it became a great series of a number of movies were made with the same theme, and of course the cartoons went by the same theme, and it is Transformers more than meets the eye. And that's what we have today in a sense, because we have an experience of God in Jesus Christ that was not clearly evident uh, all the time. Jesus interacted with his disciples. Jesus went and interacted with the people on a daily basis. Jesus got hungry. Jesus was thirsty. Jesus got tired. Jesus sometimes got aggravated. Jesus uh, engaged in conversations with people. He, he laughed. He cried. He ate. He drank. He traveled. He wanted to get away so he could pray. And he was frustrated when he couldn't get away from the people. He healed folk. He he helped folk. He he was he was um, he was relatable. You could relate to Jesus. It's not as if he stood from afar or had a barrier around him that you couldn't breach. The children would come up and get into his lap, and the disciples would get all upset and bent out of shape. And Jesus would say. You must come to me as a little child if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven. Do not bar them from entering into my presence. Jesus was relatable. You could talk with Jesus. You could laugh with Jesus. You could cry with Jesus. You could eat with Jesus. You could play with Jesus. You could spend time with Jesus. He was relatable. On the Mount of Transfiguration, however, we got to see a different side of Jesus. We got to see that side of Jesus that was evident at his baptism, that side of Jesus that became evident in the temptations in the wilderness, that side of Jesus that confronted Satan directly and repeatedly, that side of Jesus that said no to temptation, that side of Jesus that said, not my will but thine be done. That side of Jesus that stood before the Sanhedrin and identified himself as the I Am, Yahweh Elohim, the creator of this universe. That side of Jesus who said, I am the bread of heaven. We got to see in the transfiguration Jesus, not just the man, but Jesus as God incarnate in human flesh. When I was a kid growing up at Walnut Hill Methodist Church, I remember there was a stained glass window in the back of the sanctuary, and I loved looking at it, and the sun would shine through it, and it was always a gorgeous sight, and Jesus is depicted in the stained glass window, and usually you can see his face, you can see his clothing, you see his hands, you can see where the nails were in the hands, and it was just a wonderful view, and I remember looking at this stained glass window one day and being struck at how the sun was coming right through at his face. And so I could make out his clothing as it was brighter than normal, his hands as they were brighter than normal, but his face you couldn't make out at all because the sunlight was coming through right there. And looking back upon it today, I'm reminded that this is kind of what we were seeing in the transfiguration scene there on the mountain. Jesus has gone up the mountain with three of his disciples, the most important ones, the inner circle of the inner circle. Peter, James, and John, who also sometimes got themselves into some significant trouble. After all, James and John, Zebedee, the sons of thunder, and Peter, the impetuous one who liked to put his right foot in his mouth, sometimes all the way down to the knee. He was very good about speaking when he shouldn't be speaking. And he does it here, too. On the Mount of Transfiguration, this cloud settles. And they see Jesus being transformed, and his face becomes dazzling, uh, bright as the sun and his clothing dazzling bright as it fluoresces with the power of the glory of God and, 
And, and Peter is excited. He wants to be involved in this. Let us make three booths, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, because Moses and Elijah were there with him. And Jesus wasn't just being transformed. He was also in conference with the great lawgiver and the great prophet of the Hebrew Scriptures, Moses and Elijah. So let's be involved with this, Peter says. Let's build three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And God's voice then cracks out in the white, bright cloud that has overshadowed them and says, this is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Shh, Peter, hush. And listen to Jesus. Pay attention to what's going on here. Don't just run off at the mouth or have your own agenda, but pay attention to what you're seeing and what you're experiencing. We have here a very fascinating series of connections in this experience between Peter, James, and John in the very presence of God and God's voice in the cloud and God in Jesus, we have a, we have a very similar parallel to another story from Exodus, the one we heard read, the Old Testament lesson this morning. The scene where Moses is called by God to go up on Mount Sinai and he takes Joshua with him and he goes up the mountain into the cloud and, and God's presence is known in the cloud and, and God's glory is revealed. It's a, it's a fascinating line here. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire, an all-consuming devouring, that's power, my friends, fire on top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. The connections between God's appearance on Mount Sinai and God's appearance on Mount Tabor, the, the connections between God's appearance here at the giving of the law of the Ten Commandments of the Mosaic Covenant unto Moses and the appearance of God on the mountain with Moses and Elijah on either side in Jesus of Nazareth and the disciples observing it. The, the connections here are numerous. First of all, it takes place on a mountain. Secondly, the cloud descends, representing God's presence in both stories. The voice of God speaks from the cloud. The glory of the Lord, indicating the power of God, is there in both cases. The glory of the Lord in its appearance in both cases is a startling, bright, powerful, billowing, all-consuming fire and light and energy and brilliance. Moses would come down from the mountain with his face glowing. And he would put a veil over his face uh, so that he wouldn't terrify the people, but they would be frightened anyway because he had been in the presence and the, in the Shekinah glory of God there on the mountain. And so his face would be glowing. Likewise, Jesus is glowing with the presence of God. And the companions, uh, uh, Moses' people, the Israelites, they saw him and were terrified. Likewise, Peter, James, and John hear the voice of God, see the glowing of Jesus, and are terrified. Moses is in both stories. Moses and Elijah point to God at Mount Sinai repeatedly in the Old Testament. Here, Moses and Elijah are found pointing to God in Jesus Christ, pointing to the Word of God in Jesus Christ. Both Moses and Elijah, associated with Mount Sinai, proclaiming the Word of God in the law and the Word of God in the prophets, the Word of God as revealed by God on Mount Sinai, and the Word of God as sourced through the prophets to the people in Elijah. We have these two witnesses now in the story here on the mountain with Peter, James, and John witnessing to Jesus, recognizing Jesus, pointing to Jesus, affirming Jesus and His identity and His nature as He stands there and is from, fluorescing from the inside with the light and the glory of God. Jesus more than meets the eye. Jesus, not just Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Not just Jesus of Nazareth, son of Mary. Not just Jesus of Nazareth, a carpenter, son of carpenters. 
Jesus, Son of God. Jesus, Messiah of the Lord. Jesus, Word of God. Jesus, Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the word, world. Jesus, Bread of Heaven. Jesus, Light of the World. Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus, the one through whom God makes God's presence known and experienced for all, to all, and with all in a broken and hurting world. Moses goes up on the mountain to receive the law. The people are terrified. They hear the voice of God in the thundering. Thunder is peeling off the mountain. They see the glory of God and the consuming fire shining forth from the cloud. Peter, James, and John go up with Jesus, and the cloud descends, and they experience the presence of God in the all-consuming light that glows from Jesus as He's transfigured in their midst. And they hear the voice of God speaking, This is my Son, the Beloved. With Him I am well pleased. Listen to Him. The response of the Israelites and the response of Peter, James, and John is important. Because after running off at the mouth, Peter recognizes his error. And the three of them go down flat on their faces. When the disciples heard this, it says, when, it's, when the disciples heard the voice of God booming forth from the cloud, when the disciples heard this, they fell on the ground and were overcome by fear. Jesus more than meets the eye. Are we going to be open to the all-consuming, life-transforming presence of God in Jesus? Or are we going to go through our lives blithely talking about Jesus and me? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. We talk and we talk about Jesus, we talk about God in such personal terms. Me and Jesus, what a friend I have in Jesus. Jesus is my friend. Jesus is our brother. We talk about Jesus in these relational and friendship and family terms constantly. We talk about God in relational friendship and family terms, and yet we do so sometimes to the point that we fail to go on our faces in recognition that yes, God is imminent here and now, but also God is transcendent beyond the here and now. In our opening hymn today, we sang, immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes, most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. We're always wanting to gather God in so close that we realize and we fail to realize and we fail and we run off on our mouths like Peter when we should be on our faces. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, was present, fluorescing through Jesus like a stained glass window. Now, Jesus couldn't be walking around all the time fluorescing that way. No one would have been able to relate to him. The disciples wouldn't have been able to relate to him. The children would have been afraid to come to him. No one would have come to him for healing. No one would have come to him for learning. Uh, he couldn't have been arrested. He couldn't have been tried. He couldn't have been convicted. He couldn't have been executed. If he'd been walking around fluorescing constantly this way, he never would have said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. We experience Jesus as human in the Gospels. But do we experience Jesus as God in our living? See, one of the most basic affirmations of the Christian faith, a basic affirmation which is highlighted in the transformation of Jesus here on the mountain, the basic affirmation is that Jesus is God. He's not just a good and wise teacher. He's not just a rabbi from Nazareth. He's just not a healer or a prophet. 
Jesus is far more than prophet. Jesus is God. God incarnate, enfleshed amongst us. And in the transfiguration, God is shining forth like through a stained glass window for us to see and to know, for the disciples to see and to know that Jesus is God present in our midst. This is the last Sunday of the Sundays after Epiphany. Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. I want you to come to the Ash Wednesday service and remember that we are dust and to dust we shall return. Next Sunday is the first Sunday of Lent. A time to prepare to see our participation in the arrest, the trial, the punishment, the crucifixion and death of Jesus. A time of preparation to witness that we are the reason for this season. Jesus came that we might not know separation from God, but might be reconciled to God by His grace and His love. And that we might see ourselves and experience ourselves in His death on the cross for us, that we will be there with Him. It's a time to get ready to recognize our participation in the death of Jesus, in the coming and death of the Son of God for us, in the self-giving love of God that did not count equality with God as something to be grasped or held onto, but emptied himself into the form of a servant and became one of us and then died for us. The season of Lent is time to recognize that the one who fluoresces through Jesus of Nazareth, God incarnate in human flesh, fluorescing through Jesus of Nazareth there on the mountain, is the God who dies for us. Indeed, Jesus ends the, the whole passage here by making reference to this. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man, that's himself, has been raised from the dead. He has to die first to then be raised. Don't tell anyone about this until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. As we move into the season of Lent, let us be amongst the disciples who look upon, who gaze upon Jesus fluorescing as God incarnate in human flesh and recognize that it is this Jesus who comes into this world to re reveal the love of God to us in this world will be the one who will die for us out of love for us, out of God's love for us. Jesus is more than meets the eye. He is far more than meets our eye. We simply have to look with faith, fall on our faces as Peter, James, and John finally did, and recognize that we are in the presence of God when we proclaim Jesus our Lord. Let me dwell in your presence, Lord. Let me learn at your been listening to a sermon by Dr. Gregory Neal, Senior Pastor of the First United Methodist Church in Commerce, Texas, and Rector of Grace Incarnate Ministries. Copyright 2017 by Dr. Gregory S. Neal. All rights reserved. For more information and for other sermons by Dr. Neal, visit us on the web at www.revneal.org 
That's www.revneal.org. You are also invited to visit us in person at First United Methodist Church, 1709 Highway 24, Commerce, Texas, 75428. This program was produced by Dr. Greg Neal.